Okay, good afternoon, morning, and evening, everyone, wherever you find yourselves in the world. Uh, I'm a bit of a wild card, not on the schedule, but kindly uh, the TSA invited me to present work that I missed presenting last week. So with that, I'll present to you uh, a carry on a bit from what uh, Ricky kindly discussed about subsidized predators, in this case, corvids as subsidized predators of freshwaters, freshwater turtles and tortoises globally. Uh, subsidized predators can be animals that are native or introduced whose populations proliferate on account of human subsidies. These can include food, water, shelter, or essentially trickle downs, uh, trophic cascades from release from predation pressure. When we think of subsidized predators, most of the time we're thinking about mid-size mammalian predators, red foxes, raccoons from North America, opossums, domestic dogs and cats are all excellent examples. But perhaps one group that has largely flown under the radar in this case are the corvid birds, and in particular the subfamily Corvinae. This includes the ravens and the crows. Um, they tend to be highly mobile, occasionally nomadic, highly social, and if known for nothing else, being highly intelligent as well. What perhaps is really interesting and both concerning from a conservation perspective of these animals as subsidized predators um, is their ability to transmit information culturally, both among themselves and to their offspring, which can make them very proficient uh, predators and scavengers. Their dietary and, and in general habitat generalists, uh, which bodes really well for their ability to occupy human dominated landscapes, urbanization, agriculture, and otherwise disturbed habitats. Uh, and also compared to a lot of subsidized predators that we are used to dealing with in conservation and wildlife management, um, corvids are very long lived. In the wild, ravens typically surpass a decade, but are known to live 18 to 20 years. And I think a really important point to emphasize here as well is that universally all of the the crow and raven species I'll be discussing in this talk are IUCN listed as least concern. And as I'll show you as well, they all have uh, increasing, if not drastically increasing populations. Uh, this is in contrast to, of course, the organisms that we're most familiar with here, the Chelonians. These are animals uh, whose populations are highly sensitive to adult mortality. They have this bet hedging life strategy, which involves low annual reproductive effort, low and highly variable annual recruitment, very high adult survival, which as a consequence leads to long generation times. Um, they, they grow slow, they recover very slowly, and most notably what has united many of us here today um, is that these animals are highly uh, conservation dependent in many cases. Um, I have included IUCN logos throughout this talk to show you about the particular Chelonian species I'm discussing and where they fit on the conservation spectrum. And as you'll see, uh, their status contrasts very sharply with that of their corvid predators in that many species are vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. So throughout this talk, I'm, uh, my objectives here are to examine the regional population trends for both corvid, uh, predatory corvid birds and chelonians. Uh, I'm presenting a number of novel case studies and I've reviewed the literature about corvids as a threat to chelonians. And ultimately I'm using this to evaluate our understanding about whether corvids are a justifiable threat and then if so, discussing the management strategies that are relevant where they happen to threaten the persistence of uh, the Chilean, Chilean populations that we're concerned with. Uh, I'll start my studies here in North America because these uh, are most familiar to me from my work in Ontario, Canada, and I'll take this globally here. Um, I'll have in my presentation here contrasting slides in which I present uh, the corvid population trend, followed by the case studies in which they're hunting Chelonians and discuss the conservation implications of this. Okay, so throughout this bird conservation region of eastern North America called the Boreal Hardwood Transition Zone, uh, common raven populations have increased by 265% since the mid-1960s. 
Um, this means that these birds have become incredibly abundant, as you can see from this graph here. They have a very high relative abundance. Um, likewise, through a very close and allied region throughout eastern North America, the populations of common raven have undergone an absolutely astounding uh, increase in abundance, in fact up to 10,000%. But do take note of the scales here, they are still relatively uncommon, but much, much more common than they used to be. Those red dots on the map here relate to case studies that I'm about to discuss with regards to uh, Chelonians and uh, mass predatory events. This here is the Western Painted Turtle, and the red dot is in Northwestern Ontario on the North Shore of Lake Superior. In the year 2000, at a nesting site along a set of railway tracks, 20 adult females were found killed during the nesting season. In the subsequent decade, there have been increasing reports of scattered mortality, and again in 2017, an additional 20 adults were killed at a single nesting site. Uh, direct observers have conveyed to me that raven predation now occurs quite often along linear corridors in human disturbed landscapes. This includes railroads, unpaved roads, and gravel pits, essentially the sorts of habitats that these birds are very capable of surveying and regularly do survey for easily accessible prey, including nesting female turtles. What I'd like to draw your attention to in the bottom right hand corner here is um, uh, a photo taken by a wildlife pathologist who investigated this case of these raven kills. And what you'll see is a large puncture in the leg pocket of these painted turtles. And that's something that will be a reoccurring theme throughout this talk. So we've gone from Northwestern Ontario down into Central Ontario for case studies two and three. In 2012, we had the report of a total of 11 painted turtles killed all again during the nesting season and mostly, once again, the most sensitive demographic reproductive females along, once again, a disturbed human corridor um, where these birds are highly subsidized and becoming increasingly abundant. Um, case study three uh, comes from Algonquin Provincial Park, a long-term study site uh, for turtles here in Ontario. And once again, about nine to 10 turtles killed in 2010 and 2011 by ravens throughout this area where they're increasing in abundance. What's quite notable is that this is a protected area. Um, however, this occur occurred, these mortality events occurred at a particularly um, disturbed area, a hydro cut and hydro right away, uh, which the birds frequent. Uh, moving slightly more eastbound here into Maritime Canada and the Northeastern United States, um, we see very similar population trends in the common raven. Um, although not as drastic as those that I just presented, we are seeing increases of about 30% uh, over the past 40 years. Um, and these case studies that I'm about to show you are uh, really interesting, I think, for their severity um, despite what is a relatively modest increase in these subsidized predators at these locations. Relatively recently, biologist Michael Marchand published a short note uh, in which 48 uh, nesting female painted turtles and one adult male were killed at a single nesting site in a single year. This was along an unpaved clearing road. Um, and once again, we see these injuries to the hind limb pocket, which are very characteristic of uh, the predation tactics of these birds. Uh, once again, this species still is of least concern and relatively common and abundant throughout the Northeastern United States and Canada. Um, and here's just those contrasting photos here. There's, it's often very obscure, obscure how to identify the predatory tactics of um, birds, but a common strategy is to puncture uh, the inguinal or the groin pocket of these females, flip them over uh, and kill them when they're nesting, removing the eggs and uh, their internal organs. Uh, where this begins to shift to be of considerable conservation note is this example with wood turtles in uh, the province of New Brunswick, Canada. Along an unpaved road between 2011 and 2012, 45 adults, wood turtles were found killed um, and subsequent observations confirmed that this was the actions of both American crow and common raven. Among three additional monitored sites 
uh, during this time, there have been a recorded 57 additional mortalities. These have not been directly attributed to, wood, um, to ravens as predators, although they are uh, suspect. Uh, so here's the lay of the case studies right here in northeastern North America. I think it's notable that these locations are hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers apart. And yet we're seeing both increasing population trends of these birds as well as these um, patchy, isolated uh, mass mortality events. Perhaps another case study that doesn't need a great deal of introduction among those on this call is the case study of common ravens down in the southeastern or southwestern United States, particularly in uh, California and in particular as it affects the desert tortoise. Uh, mean common raven abundance has increased by over 300% since 1966. And once again, this is highly facilitated by us providing food, water, and shelter subsidy to these birds. Uh, here are some photos here, and this is where the case studies start to become much more drastic. Uh, these are photos provided by Peter Woodman from the late 1980s. And these are shells of juvenile desert tortoises recovered from underneath a single nest, a single raven nest during a single breeding season. Um, in the photo shown here, there are about 140 tortoise shells of 190 that were eventually found. The gopher tortoise is vulnerable, but provisionally assessed as critically endangered. And the common raven uh, is a major threat and has been known to be a major threat for the past 40 years. Here's a general timeline, and I don't expect you'll be able to review all of these in detail, but starting as early as 1977, there were elevated levels of juvenile mortality noted by common ravens, and as you can see, that would quickly climb to be of major conservation concern. In many cases, there are dozens to hundreds of juvenile tortoises being found in the vicinity of perch or nest sites of common ravens. Today, about 76% of desert tortoises are below viability. That is to say that um, in terms of long-term population viability, these are effectively ghost populations that are going extinct. These ravens are a huge issue and efforts to control them have been largely unsuccessful or a bit underwhelming, at least in terms of the scale of the initiative. Um, and this continues to happen today. Um, but what's most concerning is that this issue is scaling up. Not only uh, have juvenile tortoises been targeted for the past several decades, but attacks by common ravens have graduated to be on adult female tortoises in particular. As we know about the life history of these animals, um, if these females start to experience increased levels of mortality, um, there are massive, population, massive implications for continued population decline. Um, this is a scenario that should be taken extremely seriously um, on top of the mounting number of other threats that the desert tortoise is experiencing. Um, jumping from North America to the Mediterranean, um, brown neck ravens as well as carrying crows, it's a very similar story in arid desert habitats. They've been highly subsidized in nesting habitat through infrastructure. Um, so a number of species such as Testudo warneni, also known as Testudo clumeni, or, or not also known, but rather recently, uh, relatively recently redescribed new populations as new species are critically endangered and yet their populations are falling quickly in parts of Israel and perhaps also Egypt. I think particularly telling is the work of, of Perry and colleagues from the mid 1990s, in which over their three year survey period, crow carrying crow populations increased by 20 fold, whereas tortoise populations plummeted by 500 fold. Um, just as the case studies elsewhere from North America, the damages to shells and the identification of corvids as these primary subsidized predators is uh, very much obvious and apparent. Recently published in scientific reports, uh, Amelia Segarra and colleagues uh, wrote of 50% of the juvenile spurred thigh tortoises they found in a protected area of Morocco um, were killed by nesting common ravens, which may be subsidized by small local communities. Suffice to say, this is, uh, these are patchy 
uh, observations, but when likely scaled across the landscape, they have large conservation um, applications. In South Africa, um, this is probably the case that is most, most well studied and as analogous to the desert tortoise. Um, Southern African breeding bird atlas data suggests that there are significant increases in pied crows, um, especially among treeless habitats of the desert and the scrublands. Um, this is especially true because these animals are being, these birds that is, are being provisioned with uh, nesting infrastructure where nesting is normally limited. They're able to take advantage of telephone poles, hydro towers, and so forth on which to lay their eggs. Over 50% of populations uh, monitored in South Africa of the pie crow have increased and 25% of monitored populations have increased greater than 100% uh, within the past couple decades. Um, in the Northern Cape, um, where Victor Lawyer does a lot of his work with dwarf tortoises, for instance, in 2000 to 2004, pied crows were present in less than 5% of surveys. By 2012, they're present in 50% of surveys, approximately. These are birds that are increasing in abundance very, very quickly, once again, provisioned by people. And much like we see with the desert tortoise case studies, this is ramping up incredibly quickly and it's particularly impacting a lot of the species of dwarf tortoises and for which both juveniles and adults are highly susceptible to mortality. Um, earliest observations of pied crows uh, inducing mass mortality in tortoises starts as early as 1994. And as you can see by the mid 2000s, we have very large scale mass mortality events that are going on, including case studies as high as 475 juvenile tortoises found from clusters of raven or crow nests. Um, this case study stands out in particular um, it's published by Fincham and Lambrex in 2014, where a single pair of pie crows that were nesting on an old windmill during the approximately 50 day nesting period, over two years, they killed over 450 tortoises. In 2012, at least 160 were consumed. In 2013, 315 juvenile tortoises were eaten. As I've kind of alluded to, a lot of these events are, seem to be occurring in spatial isolation, but because these birds are so wide ranging and they cover so much ground while foraging, a single nest can have very, very far reaching impacts on these populations. As is the case with the desert tortoises, recruitment in many of these populations has been driven to zero, mainly because of subsidized predators, both mammal and bird. It's easy to see how many of these populations are only hanging on because the adults are not vulnerable, but the juveniles are being selectively removed, causing universal recruitment failures. Uh, taking this full circle now, uh, the final case study I'll present here is from Australia. Although uh, abundance records for these ravens and crows are um, not yet published, long-term trend data is not available, reports generally uh, call the little raven and the Australia raven super abundant, widespread, and the IUCN recognizes them as increasing. Where regional data is available is, oops, is on the outsides of Perth here in Western Australia, and that's where things get both really interesting and quite concerning. Um, these animals, of course, are experiencing the same subsidies. Uh, these birds are experiencing the same subsidies as elsewhere in the world. Um, and they're a compounding threat on top of red fox and a number of introduced predators. I think perhaps the most or the greatest reason for concern of corvids in Western Australia, where they've tripled uh, in abundance uh, in the past 20 years, is with the Western swamp turtle that's critically endangered. There are only 30 wild individuals known of the Western swamp turtle up until the late 1980s. Subsequent conservation efforts have begun to recover them, but the Australian raven maintains a major um, or maintains its position as a major predator for these turtles. Um, the ravens are known to take hatchlings and release juveniles. They'll regularly attack and maim adults. 
in other areas of Western Australia, some of the long neck tortoise or turtles are extremely vulnerable. Um, they're regularly attacked while nesting. They're flipped over and much like the painted turtle case studies from uh, Eastern North America, uh, the ravens kill the adult females while nesting and remove their eggs and viscera. Uh, I regret a bit that I've moved through this so quickly because there's a lot of nitty gritty details to share with you, uh, but the review paper with all this is forthcoming. Uh, I think what stood out to me in undertaking this review uh, is that a lot of commonalities emerge that are worth discussing. Um, the, these patterns that I've shared with you here are geographically widespread, but they're very, very patchy. They appear to be occurring at a very low frequency when we look across landscape levels, but where these mortality events happen, they can be extremely severe. And as we know of turtle life history, um, these animals cannot take such acute pressures, never mind such chronic pressures. A lot of these mass mortality or hyperpredation events are associated with nesting corvids. So during reproduction, there's obviously a high demand for food and foraging adults will go to great lengths seemingly to get turtles. This hyperpredation is very much facilitated by linear corridors. Our use, these birds being so intelligent, use roads, railways, electrical and telecommunications infrastructure to cruise for prey. And they're highly subsidized by roadkill, which brings them to roadsides, often where turtles are found nesting. Um, yeah, I mean, these case studies are happening. It is purely correlational, but I think there is a reason to think that there is causation to this with increasing corvid population sizes. We are seeing these elevated hyperpredation or mass mortality events of turtles and tortoises. There are some uh, serious management implications that need to be discussed for this underappreciated threat. Um, we need high quality data on both predator and prey populations, but I would sincerely urge those in a position of conservation and management that delaying should not be used as justification. Um, that is delaying in data collection should not be used as justification for taking action. The most obvious thing that um, needs to be done is to reduce access to subsidies for these birds. Subsidies increase survival and they increase reproduction. So we need better waste management systems or we need to deter birds from subsidies. That is to say, um, you know, we need to put deterrence on infrastructure that can be used to subsidize nesting and the reproduction. We need to have better waste management such as using closed top garbage bins or having deterrence at dump sites that otherwise uh, increase these bird populations to such high levels. Um, recent work by Tim Shields and company for desert tortoises down in the American Southwest um, has shown that they can use drones and conduct egg oiling uh, to assist with reproductive interference. Things like nest destruction could probably be productive for curbing the reproduction of these birds, but it's a lot of work and it's really only a band-aid solution. Adversion training is being used uh, to help protect desert tortoise populations in the southwest United States, as well as with the geometric tortoises uh, down in South Africa. This involves things such as using uh, bird deterrence, using laser lights, uh, loud sounds to scare birds away from sites where tortoises are present, and also using decoy turtles uh, with poison or with noxious compounds that uh, induce the birds to vomit. The premise behind this is actually that a live bird is much more valuable than a dead one. And that is because these birds learn from each other and are so gregarious. If you can teach one bird to avoid turtle prey, it can quickly spread throughout the population. Of course, if you opt to kill that bird, um, you've only knocked one out of the population. The last, and I should emphasize, very last management strategy that should be implemented should be lethal control. There are a number of studies in both avian and turtle nest predation that show that lethal control is not an effective strategy. Um, it's only a band-aid once again. Reducing access to subsidies, which involves changing human behavior, is the single most important management strategy. All others are just stepwise, band-aid, and generally ineffective solutions, at least on the long term. So I wanted to close with this, which is an abstract from the, or a extract from the paper that's in review, and it's this. 
Even if current evidence suggests that instances of turtle population overexploitation by corvids are relatively spatially isolated, the severity and the collective impact of these events should not be discounted. The suite of factors involved in this conservation challenge, namely the variability of the slow life histories of turtles, the additive mortality of subsidized predators, in this case corvids, but also a lot of subsidized mammals, the potential spread of specialized predatory behavior among these highly social birds and the cumulative risk of local extinctions, especially in these species of turtles and tortoises that are already severely imperiled, amounts to a perfect storm of threat. Uh, and uh, it cer certainly shouldn't be taken as alarmist, but what we already know from these bird populations is that they are increasing incredibly rapidly and that case studies of the desert tortoises in the United States, turtles, freshwater turtles in southwestern Australia, and tortoises in South Africa show that this is a threat that's not only increasing, but it's likely increasing in geographic breadth, but probably increasing in severity as well. I'm happy to take any questions, and as I understand, if you have rolled in here through the online chat, uh, I may not have too much time, but I will take a crack at a few of these questions. Question one, I see. Um, yeah, how widespread do you think raven attack is throughout the range of the various species discussed? Uh, I think I'd emphasize that by simply saying that uh, our current evidence suggests that spatially it's very patchy, but a lot of the case studies that I assembled were not from the peer reviewed literature. These came from speaking with uh, people as diverse as farmers to local wildlife biologists to um, local landowners. So I think the really important point here being is that this is very much under evaluated as a threat. We have no idea how spatially widespread this is in most case studies. And so it requires a lot more eyes on the ground. Uh, I think that's a really important lesson to take away. Uh, what sources of food and water are humans giving to these birds? Um, well, water mostly comes in the form of things like agricultural ponds, uh, troughs for livestock, uh, um, in agricultural settings, um, e a heck, even fountains in things like urban areas. In terms of food, these birds are habitat uh, and dietary generalists, so everything from agricultural crops, which they're regularly known to be pests of, to fast food items that are tossed in a dumpster in urban centers, to litter that people throw on the side of the road while they are uh, driving. So really any sources of food are suitable. Many of these animals are carnivorous, or the birds, sorry, are carnivorous or scavengers, but they will readily take vegetative matter and seeds and so forth as well. So um, as dietary generalists, indeed, they'll feed on a lot of different things. Uh, question, another question, do, how do seagulls compare to corvids in terms of predation threat? Uh, although I particularly focused on corvids, uh, gulls would be an excellent uh, one to investigate further. There is a really interesting case study uh, from an area called Dassin Island, South Africa, in which the gull species present there is a predator of uh, angulate tortoises. It seems like a much more spatially uh, explicit uh, or rather spatially limited scenario. I'm not aware of any mass mortality events from gulls caused to freshwater turtles and tortoises, but there are some recorded events in the literature from other generalist species, such as magpies, uh, blackbirds, and uh, red-winged blackbirds in particular in, in North America. Uh, why aren't crow predators increasing since there are so many crows now? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, a lot of corvids uh, can be extremely territorial. So for instance, why aren't raptors increasing on account of say corvid prey? Well, a lot of ravens, for example, uh, are highly territorial. In fact, they harass and displace a lot of raptors uh, off of nests. So um, corvids really come to dominate in a lot of ways as predator scavengers. They're just very assertive animals uh, and are able to capitalize on a lot of, uh, well, a lot of opportunity. 
Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get to all questions, but thanks very much to everyone. I'll keep an eye on the chat on the YouTube page. Good luck to the rest of the presenters, and uh, thank you to the TSA.